much for joining us. And now I'm going to welcome Pastor Nicholas for today's message. So my name is Nicholas. I'm the campus pastor here at Calvary Fellowship. But this is not my only job. I work as a chemistry professor at UConn. That's what sort of pays my wages. And I teach classes, but also have a group of research students doing work. One of the things that college professors have to do, especially those in the sciences, is bring in money from grants or from industry. Because chemistry research is expensive, and you have to bring in the funds to do it. I think back to the early 2000s, I met this Saudi Arabian oil baron at a conference. And he offered my research team a chunk of money to do some work for his company. It was around the time of Thanksgiving and everybody was off for the holidays. This oil guy was very impatient and kept badgering me to get started on, on the work. And in the end, rather than draw up a concrete agreement, I just got into the work and got it going. And in my heart of hearts, I knew this was not the best thing to do. But I didn't want to lose out on what seemed on the surface like a great opportunity for my future. But then things started to go wrong. He would call me late at night, sending demanding emails, wanting more and more. And I narrowly escaped him drop shipping a 55-gallon drum of crude oil outside my lab in stores. But then he got more aggressive. And it wasn't like I could go to him with a proper agreement saying exactly what the scope of work was. I'd skipped that piece when I set the whole thing up. And so while things seemed great when they started, I was now in a world of hurt. But by God's grace, things worked out in the end. But not until I had many stressful days and sleepless nights and got into some trouble all around. Have you ever found yourself compromising your values for what seems like a quick win? For instant satisfaction or cutting a corner, doing something you know in your heart of hearts is not the best thing to do in the circumstances. I think we can all probably think of times when we've done this. Sometimes we get away with it or the consequences are just minor and we can be tempted to do it again and again. We stretch the limits more and more, but eventually the consequences are major. The result could be loss of a job, breakdown of a marriage, fracture of a family, financial implosion, or even jail time. The decisions we make on a daily basis are so important. They dictate the direction and quality of our life. They direct the quality of relationships with the people closest to us, the people we love the most, the people that love us the most. And the crazy thing is that sometimes we can believe right and do wrong. We can say, here's what I believe, and here's what I tell others. Here's what I want my kids to do, but then here's what I do. It's a disconnect between what we believe deep down and what we want to do. As we move into a new year, I want us to look at an encounter from the Old Testament. It comes as a warning to us. I want us to heed the warning as we head into 2022 and do that as we mean to go on. Now this encounter involves two brothers. It happens in about 1800 BC and the brothers are essentially twins but one of them is born first so is always seen as the older son and the other came out of the womb holding the leg of the firstborn and is seen as the younger son. This image of the younger grabbing the leg of the older is symbolic of the sim, sort of the, the sibling rivalry and jealousy that will manifest itself throughout their lives. The older brother grew up to be a hunter and a warrior, but he doesn't value and appreciate what he has in life. He's always looking for the next thing, the next deal, the next pleasure. The younger brother was a thinker, a schemer, and a really good cook. But he's really devious and jealous and wants what his older brother has. Do you know who I'm talking about? It's Esau and Jacob. These two guys were Abraham's grandsons. They were Isaac and Rebekah's sons. As the older brother, Esau, would automatically inherit something because he was older. But it's very strange to us. It's called his birthright. In other words, he had certain rights that came to him 
because of his birth order. Now, there's no real modern equivalent of this. We would push back on it if there were because of the way it works. If you're the firstborn son, you had special privileges. Not because you were talented, not because you were disciplined, not because you were first, uh, simply because you were firstborn. But maybe the best thing of all is if you were the firstborn son, you got what was called judicial authority. This meant that if there was a dispute amongst family members, you got to decide. And when there was a family blow up back then, it wasn't just a war of words, you know, raised voices and slammed doors. Now, in those days, blood was basically shed. It was a really big deal. But if you were the firstborn son, you could sit down with the extended family and say, I've heard all the evidence. Here's what we're going to do. And your word was law. And you also got what was called your father's special blessing, which in that culture was the equivalent of God's blessing. So that's the context. Now let's read the account of the specific encounter that occurred between these two brothers. We find it in Genesis chapter 25. It's verses 27 to 34. It says, The boys grew up. And Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That's why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. So Esau was a man's man. You'd find him watching the Discovery Channel and shopping at Cabela's. On the other hand, Jacob liked to be at home and enjoy cooking. You'd find him watching the Food Network and shopping in Whole Foods, Williams, Sonoma, or perhaps Bed Bath and Beyond. Two very different people. Now one day Jacob was making a stew. And Esau came back from his day's hunting out in the open countryside. And he was famished. The Hebrew word here actually means he was weary or faint, short-tempered or very hungry. Now I remember back to uh, the 2018 Winter Olympics when snowboarder uh, Chloe Kim used the term hangry for being hungry and angry at the same time. And that brought that word into common parlance. So I think we could actually say that Esau was hangry. He just wanted to eat. And he said to Jacob, his younger brother, quick, give me some of that stew now. But Jacob was in control as he'd made the stew and was the one who could serve it up. Now this situation, this dynamic, actually rarely happened back then. By that I mean, rarely was it that the younger, weaker brother had leverage over the older, stronger brother. Now as I said, Jacob was a good cook, but he was also really crafty, and very jealous. Jealous of his older brother's birthright, given just because Esau was born first. But in this instant, Jacob realised that he had leverage over Esau. He thought, my older brother needs something from me. And so Jacob decided to leverage the opportunity to bargain with his brother. Now, if you've got siblings, this is probably the sort of thing you might have done. One saying to the other, like, well, you know, you don't want dad to know how that scratch appeared on the car, do you? What's it worth for me not to tell him? Or, I know you stuck it, snuck in late last night. What's my silence worth? What's it worth for me to keep my mouth shut? Now, if they're shrewd, they start the bidding high, thinking, what's the most I could possibly get out of this? 
and then work their way down until the deal is done. Now in our family dynamic in this story, Jacob is a thinker, he's manipulative, but Esau is impulsive and he's wild. On the Myers-Briggs personalities test, Esau is like an ESTP, and Jacob is like a J-E-R-K. Jacob sees his opportunity and seizes it. He thinks, go big or go home. So when Esau begs for some stew, Jacob replies, first, sell me your birthright. Now from the outside looking in, this seems like a crazy ask. Esau's birthright equates to his whole future. Now who in their right mind would trade their future for a bowl of stew? It seems preposterous, not even for a lifetime of stew. Who would trade their value system for a bowl of stew, their self-respect for a bowl of stew? Who would trade their relationship with their husband or wife for a bowl of stew? Who would trade their relationship with their kids, with their family, with their friends for a bowl of stew? Who trade their trade their reputation, their profession, their opportunity for their future for a bowl of stew? We think the answer is nobody would, but the real answer is potentially everyone would. It's instant satisfaction over delayed gratification. Now, when we read it within the context of this story, we just laugh and think he like he would trade his birthright for a bowl of stew but when it's us and it's right in front of us it's amazing the bad trades that we're willing to make it's amazing some of the bad trades that some of us have already made in the past we've seen it we've done it we've lived it in many ways this story is our story it gets into the psychology behind how things work in us and why we do the things we do Listen to what happens next. Look, Esau says, look, I'm about to die. Now, in reality, he isn't. But he's doing what we all do. He's building a case. This is a big deal. This isn't just a bowl of stew. This is life or death. He's justifying it in his own mind and lying to himself. And what he says next is reflected in the things that we think and say to ourselves. He says, what good is my birthright to me? Am I going to add two more words that I want to just add? Because this helps us focus on what's really going on. What's good, what good is the birthright to me right now? In Esau's mind, he's convincing himself that it's not worth anything to him right now. It's not worth anything until his dad dies. And that's later. That's later on. Esau is fixated with the right now. How he can satisfy himself right now. How he can get what he wants right now. But the issue is that now is now. It's fleeting and very quickly gone. It becomes the past. But Esau can't see that. Jacob pounces on this moment of weakness, saying, so what are you willing to trade? Building his case, creating a narrative, and he makes Esau swear an oath. Now, in those days, an oath was a big deal. And Esau swore an oath, and in an instant, he sold or traded his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. Again, if we're standing on the outside of this, we think it's utter madness. But in the heat of the moment, we're tempted to do the same thing. Jacob gives Esau some bread and some stew. And Esau gets to satisfy his hunger. <clears throat> but I wanted to pick up on a nuance in the text. We know that Esau was a manly man, a hunter. Someone who liked the rugged outdoors. So he probably expected the stew to be hearty and full of meat. But what he gets is a bowl of lentil soup. It's like he thought he was going to get the steak dinner. But instead, he got the vegetable option. 
Now, if it was me, I'd be okay with that, but not Esau. Even when he gets what he thinks he wants, it turns out to disappoint. And haven't we all been there? We bend the rules to get what we want, only to be disappointed. We think we know what we want, but when we get it, we're just not satisfied. And to get it, we've compromised our future. And then here's how the narrative ends. So Esau despised his birthright. He convinces himself that it's not all that valuable, that what he's traded is not really all that much. It's not that big of a deal. Esau decided, I don't care. And again, this is so instructive to us. It's exactly what we do. We decide we don't care when it's too late to care. We decide it wasn't all that valuable after the fact when we've discounted the value. And so we decide to just try and defend ourselves, to justify what we've done. In our minds, we decide it wasn't a big deal. And we create a narrative and then we believe our own narrative. We say to ourselves, you know, I mean, what else could I have done? I would have lost my job. What else could I have done? She would never have gone out with me again. What else could I have done? I had to lie about my story. What else could I have done? What else could I have done? I didn't have any choice. And we believe the story that we manufacture in our heads. We justify what we've done because we've decided that it's not that big of a deal. And often we don't even face up to it. We just hang on to our excuses. And this has consequences. Deep down, it leaves us feeling uneasy. And every once in a while, when someone tries to bring it up, we just shut them down. And in our own minds, we continue to justify ourselves with our excuses. Esau opted for the short-term satisfaction of a bowl of stew over the long-term blessing of his birthright. He's literally eaten his inheritance. Now, if you read on later in the book of Genesis, you can see how this incident plays out down the line. Jacob's craftiness and Esau's short-sightedness set in motion a series of events that would rip this family apart for decades. It wasn't just about the two brothers anymore. It was about everyone related to them for a couple of generations. The consequences of one action by one person on one day impact many people for many years. Now every day for us, we have things competing for our attention and decisions we have to make. And we have to decide whether we will opt for instant satisfaction over delayed gratification. And at some level, we'll all be tempted to trade our future for what amounts to a bowl of stew. And in the heat of the moment, it doesn't look like a bowl of the stew. But after doing it, be that a day later, a month later, a year later, three years later, five years later, we look back and we see that we, what we got in the trade wasn't worth it. And we can't go back. We opt for short-term satisfaction over long-term blessing. And it's never good to sacrifice our future for the present. In fact, everything we really value in life is gained by doing the reverse, satisfying, sacrificing the, the present uh, in study, exercise, practice, self-control, responsibility to gain the blessings of the future. Now, the comedy example of this actually comes from The Simpsons. In one of the Simpsons shows, Homer drinks a pint of vodka and mayonnaise. And when Marge questions the wisdom of this, he says, that's a problem for future Homer. And then adds, man, I don't envy that guy. So here's the question for us as we go into the new year. What's your bowl of stew? What's competing with your value system? 
What's getting in the way of you living the future that God has in store for you? What's competing for your future in the new year and beyond? Your preferred future is as if I was to say to you, you know, where do you see yourself down the line, relationally, financially, spiritually? What do you want the year to look like? And what's competing for that picture right now? What's your bowl of stew? Let me put it a different way. What or who in your life is difficult to say no to? Or what or who in your life do you know you ought to say no to, but you're talking yourself into? What are you talking yourself into that the people who love you the most would try to talk you out of? Is your bowl of stew the pursuit of money? Are you fixated by finances? Are you willing to cut corners to get that deal? Are you willing to be less than honest to make that quick buck? Is it a habit? Do you have a bad habit that's starting to control your life? Are you finding yourself addicted to something and you just can't break away from it? Is your bowl of stew your emotions? Do you let your mood dictate how you act? Is power or fame your bowl of stew? Do you want to control other people? Do you want to have all the glory? Are you striving every day for this? Not treating others with dignity and respect. Is your bowl of stew lust? Can you not keep your eyes off other people? Is it a toxic relationship or friendship? Is someone leading you away from the direction you envisage for your life? Now your bowl of stew might be one of these things or it could be something totally different. But we need to identify it and then to count the cost of it. Esau didn't count the cost. He just went in head first. We need to count the cost of our actions and decide not to let instant satisfaction lead to long-term dissatisfaction. Esau was led by his desire for instant satisfaction. And we know from so many areas in our life that this isn't good. If you don't eat well and exercise well now, your future health will suffer. If you don't maintain your car now, you'll end up on the side of the road in the future needing a tow. If you don't invest in your marriage or your kids now, you're going to drift apart as a family in the future. Esau messed up big time. He had so much, but he gave it all up. Now Esau does feature again in the Bible. But it's not good. He's in Hebrews chapter 12. He's used as a warning as to what not to do. Hebrews 12, 16 and 17 says, Watch out for the Esau syndrome, trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. You well know how Esau later regretted that impulsive act and wanted God's blessing. But by then, it was too late, tears or no tears. But shortly after the start of that chapter in Romans, it says of Jesus that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Esau gives up on his birthright, but Jesus endures his And takes it. Esau gives away his inheritance, his position, his blessing, and then pays for it for the rest of his life, alienated from his family, feeling guilty, striving for satisfaction. But Jesus endures his birthright, the pain of the cross, to be the sacrifice for our sins. But the writer of Hebrews talks about a joy. But what is that joy? That joy is that Jesus gets all of his Esau's back. 
He gets all of those who've exchanged their God-given birthright for a bowl of stew, for money, for fame, for power, for relationship, for self-controlled instant satisfaction. He gets them back. All of those who've exchanged their eternal birthright, he gets them back. He says, you can come home, you can be in the family, and it's gifted, not earned. Again in Hebrews 12, it says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, we see that he shows us how to live, how to persevere, how to live out our God-given birthright. By fixing our eyes on the joy on the other side of the cross. We can know that whatever challenge we face, if Jesus came to bring life and we put him to death, and yet still life endured with him, we can overcome any situation we face. But most importantly, he shows us how to live our lives. Because when he returned to the throne room of heaven, we don't read in that passage that he bowed down. We don't read that he continued to serve. We read that he sat down next to the throne of his father. That's because it's finished. The work is done. It's the time for joy. Jesus shows us how to live. And most important of all, he shows us how to to enjoy a relationship with God. So as we close, what is our response? It's easy to dismiss the story of Esau and Jacob. It sounds so ridiculous. Everyone who hears the story knows better. We think, who would do that? But the punch in the gut is that the answer is us. And now that you know what's at stake, today, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, and knowing that in him it's finished and that he wants you to share the joy, would you be willing once and for all to decide, I'm not going to trade what I value most for something I have a desire for now? I'm not going to trade what I value most, my preferred future. I'm not going to trade what I value most, what I know God has for me in the future. I'm not going to trade what I value most for a bowl of stew. And then would you just do what you ought to do, even if it costs you? The people who depend on you will be glad you did. The people who love you the most will be glad you did. The people you love the most will be glad you did. And most of all, unlike Esau and unlike Homer Simpson, future you will be glad you did. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the warning story of Esau and Jacob. We pray today that you would reveal to us what our bowl of stew is. And having done that, Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage to admit it, And to have the courage to do something about it. Lord, we all have appetites. But I pray, Lord, that you would curve our appetite and help us focus our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. When we feel weak, I pray that you would make us strong. 
and that we would do what we need to do. Lord, I just ask that you would be with us as we go into the new year, Lord. That you would, as you say in your prayer, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. I pray for us that you would just bless us and guide us and direct us as we move into this new year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.